Hey, good morning everybody and welcome back to Twister's Rule where I'm going through the second half of my top 25 games of all time. We've made it to the top 10. Now again, this is my personal list. If you guys agree or disagree with some of my picks or if you have like your favorite game, favorite three, favorite 10, whatever it is, feel free to leave it in the comments and, and let me know. And I'd love to, love to continue talking about some of this with you all. And the second thing, just like last time, I'm going to leave a very brief description of the stuff that I really love in games just so it kind of makes sense for some people who may not know me to, to understand why I have certain picks. But that is it. Uh, if you want to check out the last video, you can go ahead and click that in my channel. I might have it at the end of this video or in the description. We'll see what happens here. Uh, but we're going to continue moving forward. So my number 10 is going to be a party game and not just any party game, but one that involves drawing. And I'm not talking about Pictionary. We'll, we'll, we're getting that off the table for right now. No, this one is called Telestrations. This is kind of like the game Telephone where you're whispering in people's ear, except you're going to be adding drawing into the mix. Everyone at the table is going to start off with a word and they're going to have a limited amount of time to draw that word or draw clues that pertain to that word. And at the end of that time, you're going to pass on just the drawing There, you're going to flip the, the word over. You're passing on just the drawing to your next person who will look at it and try and figure out what that could be. They're going to write down in words in one word, two words, what, however many they think what that could be. Then they are going to be passing their word to the next person who's not going to look at anything before that. And they're going to instead draw what was draw out the word that they were given. And once each book has gone around the table and back to their original owners, they're going to flip through and, and see if people were able to get it the whole way through or if it started to turn a little bit sideways. And there are many interesting scenarios that can be created with this combination. Obviously, if you are able to get it right the entire way, you can kind of uh, look at the people's drawings and look at how people were able to interpret them and be like, whoa, I couldn't believe you actually got that word out of this drawing or, or look at someone's drawing and be like, man, that was such a great way to draw out that clue. But there are just as many instances where you, you're gonna be looking at someone's drawing, you're gonna be going through and be like, what in the world is that? Or, or you're gonna have someone's like, you couldn't tell what that is? Like, come on, this is, this is what the word originally was. Like, how could you not get it? And there's gonna be a lot of laugh out loud moments and interesting conversations as to how people interpreted things. Uh, this is one that has had a lot of nostalgic value, but it's not just the nostalgia. It actually plays really well as a game. We don't even play it competitively. I know there is actually like a, a way to score points and I, I don't even know what it is because we just like playing this very casually with just kind of seeing what happens, what craziness ensues. And as a side note, I even used this game as a uh, part of my proposal to my wife. So, uh, I mean, of course it's going to land in my top 10. Uh, and right now, at this point, it's going to land right at the top, or right at number 10. That is Telestrations. Now, in my last video, I mentioned there are a line of games called the Tiny Epic Games, where they, they try to deliver this epic experience in a small, tiny box. And this one's another one that is in that line. This one's called Tiny Epic Kingdoms. I used to play a lot of real-time strategy games, kind of base building, where you're building up your army, uh, you can research certain powers, build up uh, towers uh, and go out and fight other people. And this one plays exactly like that. You're going to pick one of many different fantasy races, doing all these things and collecting resources while you're doing that as well. Uh, but some of the very interesting things about this game is the sheer amount of races that you can pick and the locations you can mix and match and have an infinite replayability. Each of the races, their, their research tracker and the special powers that they have are very unique and well tied in to the, the type of people that they are. And I love the battle system that is in this game where, where you're gonna be secretly selecting a number. And of course, the higher number wins. If you have the most power, you're going to, to prevail through the battle. But the trick is you're gonna be spending resources that you, you could be using to research and build up more towers and stuff like that. So it's this mind game between, okay, how many resources do they have and how many resources do I have, but how much are, are they willing to give up? Do I want to try and like, beat them at it? Do I want to give all my resources just to winning this battle? Or do I want to maybe offer peace or, or just like kind of uh, uh, not focus it and retreat? And then the big reveal when, when you look at the dice that they have set and you spent all your resources, 
that can turn the tides of war between having a, a position on, on something that you might like where you can collect certain resources you need or where you have to retreat and you're, you're, ha you're set back a little bit. Like I said, I really enjoy the real-time strategy genre and this is a board game that, that kind of emulates that but not only does it well, it does it in a in a short amount of time. It plays under an hour and if you have the expansion it makes it even better where you have heroes and you actually have war towers that are placed on the map and everything. It, it's, it is absolutely wonderful. Uh, uh, my preferred, like if you're talking about stuff that really emulates that real-time strategy, well this is, this is my go-to game for that. So that's going to be my number nine, Tiny Epic Kingdoms. My number eight is going to be another party game, and this one you're going to be playing uh, one team versus another. It's a team versus team game, and this one's called Decrypto. Now in Decrypto, you're going to be uh, on opposite sides of the table or of the room, and in front of you you're going to have this little device that has numbers one through four, and each of those numbers have a word associated with that. Now, on every turn, there's going to be one clue giver or code master, however you want to say it. They're going to have a sequence of numbers, again, ranging between one to four, that they're trying to get their team to guess in the right order. So for example, I might have the numbers two, three, one, and I want to get my team to guess that number in the correct order by giving a clue that pertains to the, the words in the two slot, in the three slot, and then in the one slot. If your team gets it right, they continue to move on, but if they don't, they get a miscommunication token. If you get two of those miscommunication tokens, you end up losing. However, there comes a major twist starting in the second turn of each game. See, while you are giving the clues to your team, while the other people don't know the exact words that are in front of your personal device, they're going to be hearing your clues and starting on the second turn when, you're, when you've gone through the whole process of assigning a new spy master and they've given their clues, rather than your team guessing right away what the code could be, the opposing team is going to hear those clues and they're going to be trying to figure out what the code is before you do. And they're going to be hearing the, the original clues and the clues that came before and they're going to be trying to piece together, okay, maybe this clue works with this first word. Uh, this one, it doesn't seem to work with the other clues that were given here, so it might go in the fourth. And, and, the, and they're going to try and figure out what code and uh, what the words are, what numbers, what the sequence is. Uh, and they will be, have the chance to steal it before the other team. And if they manage to do that successfully, they will get a communication token. And similar to the miscommunication tokens, if you get two communication tokens, you instantly win the game. So there's a winning condition and a losing condition. And that, the fact that you have that makes it so that the clue giver has to give clues that are specific enough that your team can get the right sequence but vague enough that your opponent is kind of thrown off and confused and they can't get that sequence. Now this can bring about some really clever moments as a spy master who gives some really neat clues to help your team get what they need while, while preventing the other team from getting the right answer. And this is very similar in some ways to code names where you have someone who's the clue giver and, and, uh, and people are trying to guess uh, something that is happening in front of them. But unlike code names, this one allows you to have to be very, very specific and have almost a, a bit of finesse with the clues you give. It's kind of like code names, but like a step up above that. And I love code names as well, but this one, it, it's, it's one that I, I think allows for a little bit more clever gameplay, and it's one that I, I always love bringing to the table. So that is going to be my number eight, Decrypto. My number seven is going to be a light racing game, but Unlike many other racing games where you are going to control a car or someone who is in the race, you're in the spectator's position and you're rather betting on what's going to happen in the race. This is a light betting game called Camel Up. In Camel Up, you're observing a camel race and on your turn, it's extremely simple and very quick. You're just going to choose one of four actions given to you. You're going to either roll the dice and move a camel. You can choose to bet on which camel is going to lead at a certain leg in the race. You can choose to try and put down these tokens to help affect which camels move forward and back, or you can choose of the entire race to bet on who is going to win or who is going to lose. Now I love the betting system that is in this game where it's not too punishing for those who don't really like that sort of thing, but it still is effective enough that it will determine who is the winner and the loser of the game. Oftentimes if you lose coins, it's only going to be like one or two, but you will be gaining like three or four or five at, at a time 
quite frequently. So you're always gonna feel like you're getting somewhere. And like with most betting games, if you bet a little bit earlier than your opponent, then you'll be getting more rewards. So it creates even more intriguing situations where you wanna bet on certain camels earlier, but if you bet on them too early and something happens in the race where, where another camel passes, well then you're kind of stuck in a situation where you can't take that action back and you might be losing it. So do you bet on something earlier to get more money or do you wait it out a little bit and maybe, maybe not get as many rewards but you are for sure going to be getting uh, extra coins at the end. Not only that, but the art in this game is gorgeous and the components are really well done. You have the pop-up tree, which is a little bit flimsy, but it really adds to the element of, of the table presence. You have the, the pyramid that is well done and, and that moves and uh, shakes the dice. The camels themselves and the, the components, the, the tokens, are really good quality and they stand out and again the colors that they use really make it pop and, and really add to the the flavor of this game the the money oh it's just so much fun to to kind of play around with the the points in this game this is a game that produces lots of stand-up moments as you watch these camels race and as the the chaos is ensuing uh, it's one that works well with many different groups of people and it's, it's something that I don't think I will ever truly get sick of playing. That is my number seven, Camel Up. Speaking of great art and components, my number six is going to be Disney Villainous. In Villainous, you are going to be taking control of one of many iconic Disney villains who each are trying to accomplish their dastardly deeds that are in the movies. So you might have Prince John who is trying to acquire as much power and gold as he can, Whereas Maleficent was just wants to put curses in each of her realms. And then while all this is going on, you might have the Queen of Hearts who just wants to play a great game of croquet, moving her cards into wickets and taking a shot through all of that. Now each villain is going to be completely asymmetrical, not only in their objectives and how to win, but with their decks and the cards and their boards and the play styles as well. Each play style and, and every deck is fine-tuned to, to emulate the feeling of how that villain works. You might have Ursula who doesn't directly defeat people but rather puts them into binding contracts to, to help vanquish heroes or anyone like that. You're gonna have Prince John again who is trying to get power but the, his heroes are going to try and steal them away. You're gonna have Captain Hook who is going to be adding parts to his ship to help him do more actions. And so each villain is going to have a wildly different play style uh, and again, this is one that just has so much variability. If you're a Disney fan, there's a lot of fan service here as well. And, and like I said earlier, the art is gorgeous in this one. The cards are well done, well put together. The, the villain movers, which are like my favorite piece in this game, they're very abstract and yes, the colors just pop out and it just looks very, very good on the table as well. And again, how you play, while there is a lot of strategic elements in this game, it's very simple where you're just moving a character and, and depending on the space, you might have between two to four actions you can take. And you can take each of them once where you might take power or use some power to play a card. You might be fading someone using their specific heroes that will hinder their progress. You might be activating special abilities according to your character. It's simple, it's elegant. Each villain that you can play with plays extremely uniquely, so the replayability is, is again, really good with this game. Uh, and again, as a Disney fan myself, I, I love the fan service that it gives to this game, all the art in it, the, the villain movers, which I could like probably put on a display if I had like a game room, uh, just for other people to see it's that good. Uh, so that is the reasons why it is on uh, at the number six spot, that is Disney Villainous. Now my number five and four are going to be two party games, my, my favorite party games of all time. And number five specifically is going to be a, a play off of the system of Werewolf or Mafia. Now, uh, this specific game fixes a lot of issues that I personally have with Werewolf or Mafia, whereas it, for one, it takes a decent amount of time, and for another, if you're eliminated early, I mean, you could follow along with the story and see what happens, but at the same time, you're not really doing a whole lot. You might as well just be kind of going on to another room and, and doing a different game or something like that. But this specific game called One Night Ultimate Werewolf fixes that, where it condenses it all into one night and daytime phase, and it makes it simpler, more chaotic, and 
a lot more of a party-like game. In this game, of course, you're gonna have your classic werewolves and villagers in the game, uh, along with some special roles. And at nighttime, you, the werewolves will wake up. They won't eliminate people, but they're gonna wake up and see who each other are so that they can kind of know who to defend, who to who to uh, who is on their team that they're not trying to get rid of. And if they have special powers, they can do it then. But then when we get to the villagers, the villagers are all going to have different roles. And there are added roles in this game which spice things up. You're going to have the classic seer who looks at someone's card and like sees their role individually. But there are going to be certain cards in the deck which changes the games in big ways. You might have someone who shuffles two cards around. You might have someone where in the voting phase, if they vote for you, you might uh, it, it cancels it all out and the person you're pointing to rather is voted out. You might have someone who is like a, a detector who, who like just sticks their uh, hand out and one of the werewolves, if they're nearby, they tap on it so you know that one of the people beside you is a werewolf. And to make things even crazier, if let's say your role is switched, you become that role whether you know it or if you don't. And that's going to make things even more interesting because in daytime, you're going to be kind of figuring out what happened in the night. You're going to be working together with everyone else, trying to trying to tell your story of, of what all happened. If you, let's say someone said, okay, I'm the troublemaker and I switched these two cards around. Now, of course, they could be lying or telling the truth, but either way, whatever is being said, you're trying to suss out which of the cards uh, are werewolves, or if you're the werewolves, which are the cards are humans. And of course, you're going to be, you're spending that daytime phase talking with other people, maybe like, putting in a little bit of a lie here to try and suck out the truth from someone before you re reveal what really happened and try to catch someone off guard. There's just so many variables in this game and it makes it extremely chaotic and again the fact that if you are eliminated, let's say it gets to that final vote and you vote out a werewolf and the humans win or if you vote out the, the villagers and the werewolves win, once that vote is done and there's the elimination, really that's the game over. Whoever is voted out determines who wins or loses and you can choose to play again or you can choose to do to do something else it's just play something within like 10 to 15 minutes it's extremely extremely quick a lot of fun extremely chaotic uh, and i love chaos in games uh, such as this so that is going to be my number five one night ultimate werewolf my number four, like I said, is going to be another party game. And this one, if you know a little bit about myself, I am a huge fan of the reality TV show called Survivor. And this specific game is something that plays, it's like the closest I've seen to actually emulating a, a bit of that Survivor experience in a short amount of time and put it into a party format. This is called Dead Last. And in Dead Last, each of you will be associated with a specific color. And you're going to have a limited amount of time to decide who you want to vote out of the group. Because you're all going to be competing, kind of like a battle royale, to get the gold that is at the center of the table. However, the trick is you're not only trying to survive the vote, but you want to be in the majority of the vote as well. Because if you aren't in the majority, even if you're not being voted out, you still are eliminated from the game. Now, to even things out though, if you feel you are going to be eliminated, you can have an ambush card. Each person has an ambush card of their own that if they play successfully, if they are the target that is being eliminated, rather than them getting out of the game, they get to choose one of the people who voted for them to be eliminated instead. But again, if you play it wrong, you're eliminated. So it's this very tense situation where you're looking at people and you might be like, you might be whispering into one person's ear. Meanwhile, on, on the other side of the table, someone's looking and they're pointing to their, their shirt, kind of indicating, okay, we're voting for yellow here. Do, pay attention here. Uh, and again, it, anything goes in this game. So one person can like leave to go get a drink and everyone can kind of conspire. Okay, we're gonna get him next week. We, we're gonna get him. But those ambush cards kind of uh, add another element where it's like, okay, while you're going to get a drink, it's like, okay, did they just all talk about me? Maybe I should play my ambush card because that'd be the obvious thing to do. And so there's this, this little bit of a, a deception that's going on where you're making alliances and you're breaking them and you're kind of figuring out, okay, where is everyone at? And again, multiple play styles can win as well. I, I've seen people who uh, win being very aggressive and telling people what to do. I've seen people win just kind of observing and being like, okay, yeah, I'll follow you. And at the end, when there's two people left, you have this prisoner's dilemma with the gold, whether you want to share it with the other person, whether you want to steal all of it, or regardless of what happens, whether you want to just grab one and go with it. 
it is a lot of fun. I enjoy the the chaoticness and and the the whole yeah making small alliances or, or you know planting little seeds here and there. Uh, there is a good amount of depth that can be put into this game. It's almost like a meta type of game where uh, you you kind of discover little hints and, and tricks that you can uh, play with different game groups. But again, this is just one that I I cannot get enough of. That is my number four, Dead Last. All right, my number three is going to be a very, very quick skirmish game where you're taking one hero, pinning against another, and you're just battling and doing it out to, to see who wins. Kind of like a, like a Smash Brothers or any other fighting game uh, uh, type of deal. And this one's called Unmatched. In Unmatched, again, like I said, you're going to be pitting one fighter against another. You might have King Arthur taking on Sherlock Holmes or the Raptors from Jurassic Park taking on Bruce Lee. And, and what you're gonna be doing on your turn is you're going to be selecting out of three choices of actions. You're gonna be taking two, and you can do two different actions. You can do the same ones, but you can choose to maneuver, take a card into your hand and move. You can choose to battle your opponent, or you can choose to play what's known as a scheme card. And those are just simple effects that happen to either your character or the opposing character or the something on the board. Uh, and again, like many other games that I like, this one also has a bit of variability in that each character is completely unique. Their deck is going to be very unique. You might have King Arthur who's more of a tank and, and wants to take a little bit of hit and can deal lots of damage. Whereas Medusa wants to try and stay far away and, and kind of uh, force their opponent to using certain defense cards so she can make a really big hit with her stone gaze. Or Sinbad who gets stronger on each voyage that he goes through. Every character plays extremely unique and to make it even better, it plays within half an hour. So you can get a lot of action. The, the way the mechanics go, there's a lot of action that is packed into just a short amount of time. And once again, like so many other games that I love, the art and the components are gorgeous as well. The art on the cards are just so well done and well thought out. It really helps to bring these characters to life. The system is very, very nice and quick and it helps keeps the pace moving. There's not really many slow parts in this game. Uh, and, and it just it's it's just a lot of fun, kind of like a, a little quick burst of action in in your day. And so that's going to be my number three unmatched. My number two is actually a game that is not in print, unfortunately, and, and you can't really get it in the stores today. However, this is still a fantastic cooperative game and you can add Trader to make it a little bit interesting. Uh, but this is one where you're set in the world of King Arthur trying to accomplish quests uh, do uh, and conquer evil. Uh, this one's called Shadows Over Camelot. And in Shadows Over Camelot, like I said, you're going to be either King Arthur or one of his knights going out and completing these quests by laying cards down. And again, very simple, you, you take one action on your turn to advance the side of evil, and you take one action to advance the side of good. And so you can choose to work together, or like I said, add a bit of a traitor in the mix who might try to hide the fact that they're working together with you, but in reality is hoping that evil actually wins. Uh, and, and so it, it adds another element where not only are you playing against the board, but there's a chance that you might be playing against someone who is actually helping the, the evil side continue to get through. And, and once again, the quality of the components, the, the art in this game is wonderful. I love the King Arthur theme. That's, that's something that resonates really well with me. Uh, and it really creates for a lot of exciting moments where you can go role playing, or you can even make some like Monty Python, the quest for the Holy Grail jokes. And the fact that you're working together is a huge plus for, for someone like myself. And so that is going to be my number two shadows over Camelot. And we finally arrived to my number one all-time favorite game, and this is going to be a very cute but savage game called Root. Now Root is an asymmetric game that takes the asymmetry in a game and dials it up to 11. For every faction, it's not just like little small powers that might give them an advantage if they do this. No, each faction plays wildly differently in this war game that is happening in front of you. And so as the cats, you might be trying to control many clearings to build up these buildings, whereas the eerie, as the birds, you're, you're going to be following a specific decree and you're going to be trying to plan out your moves beforehand so that you, you continue to follow it or else your, your society crumbles. 
Whereas the Vagabond is not actually an army, but just one small piece who plays almost like a, a, a mini RPG game in the midst of it, going on quests and aiding factions, or even trying to help other factions take uh, take some some armies down. Rune is the type of game where if you are the, the sort of person who likes to put a lot of commitment into their board games and really learn the mechanisms and the ins and outs, there is a lot to explore in the world of Root. I mean, you're going to see how, which advantages and disadvantages certain factions have. Maybe as you add the expansion factions that include merchant otters or the lizards that are a part of like an, a cult of some sort or the, the underground moles that you're going to figure out which factions can help work to, to counter other factions and their strengths and, and you're going to get wildly unique games with each different combination. And with the way that the, there's so much depth in the strategy, you can be playing this game numerous times and still like not be scratching the full surface at the potential of some of these factions. And not only that, but the art in and of itself, the cards, the meeples, oh I love the way the meeples are, are made in this game with the, the colors that they use and the shapes, it really makes this game stand out above the crowd. There's so much I could talk about this game and the fact that there is an app that that helps make the game go by quicker and smoother and helps to, to make sure you have the rules down. It's there. There's just so many things that I really enjoy about Root and that is why it is my number one game of all time. And that is it for my top 25 board games of all time. Thank you so much for watching, for going through this experience with me. And again, if you want to leave a comment uh, stating what you agree with, what you disagree with, or some of your favorite games, I am always fascinated by the variety of games and the interests that people have. And so please feel free to do so. But until next time, I wish you all the best and we'll see you on the next video.